How many people came to super privileged containers yesterday? Okay. So this, this talk usually happens before super privileged containers. So everything I taught you yesterday, we're going to talk about the exact opposite. So yesterday was all about super privileged containers are all about building containers that can manage the host. They can have privileges. We turn off all the security, and they're able to actually manipulate the host operating system. What we're going to look at today is container uh, technology for actually containing and confining. If you came to Josh Bresch's talk just before, uh, he talked a lot about containers as being a potential mechanism for us to make our systems more secure by basically taking all the applications and putting them inside of containers. If you talk to me in private, I'd explain to you why SE Linux is difficult in a uh, what I call the cesspool of Unix or Linux, the way applications have been developed over the last 40 years. And actually, containers are actually going to fix a little bit about that. But uh, some of the people have heard, might have heard my, uh, some of the things I've said in the past. I'm going to cover that uh, a little later. But let's start looking at it. So we're going to cover four topics. And the coloring book actually talks about the four topics inside of it. So the, the, while um, the, the, the coloring book, everybody thinks, is kind of a joke, but last year the SE Linux coloring book was very popular because it finally explained SE Linux in terms that human beings could actually understand. Uh, so we try to do it again with the coloring book because containers is a very misunderstood uh, technology. or people's, Everybody sort of has an idea of it. Um, but when I look at it from a security point of view, there's four things that I'd like, to, like you to think about as we move into this container world. So this is container security explained by the three pigs. So first of all, uh, we're going to uh, look at... This question comes up a lot. Everybody thinks the container technology is a mechanism for getting rid of virtual machines. Okay, we're going to talk about when you use containers and when you use virtual machines from a security point of view. We're also going to talk about what platform should you run the containers on. So as we move forward to containers, you've got to think about the hardware you're going to run, the operating system you're going to run your containers on. Third chapter is going to talk about container separation. And most of you guys probably think that's what I was going to mainly talk about, and that is the bulk of, the, of this talk. It's going to be how we're doing container separation. And the fourth topic, which I think is the most important, is what do you put inside of your containers? So we're going to cover that. So those are the four main topics. So let's start it up. So when you look at your coloring book, the main thing you have to understand is the glossary up there, which is a pig equals a service. So when I talk about services here, I'm talking about usually two or more services running on a computer system, or two or more services making up an application suite. Um, is there any more seats? Could people move in a little bit so people don't have to stand? All right. Uh, so when we look at it, so we're going to be talking. When we're talking about the pigs here, we're going to be talking about, about them being applications. So think of one pig as being a web server front end, and another pig as being a database. So we want to basically figure out where we're going to have the pigs, and if the web server front end gets hacked into, what happens to the the, the back end? So chapter one: Where should the pigs live? So from a security point of view. The most secure mechanism for if you're going to have multiple services is to run each service on a separate physical piece of hardware. This is what we've been doing for years and years and years up to the time of virtualization, virtual operating systems. It is still the most secure way of running systems. There is actually a more secure way, which the government does, which is called air-gapped, where there's no network between them. Okay, so there's no way to get from one machine to another. But it, literally running physical machines, different services on physical machines or different houses for the pigs is the most secure way of running it. And, uh, the way I can explain that to you is everybody in this room and your company had one machine hacked? Oh, nobody did? Wow. Okay. After your machine was hacked, did you reinstall every single machine in your entire oper organization? No. The reason you didn't is because you believe this. Right? You believe that that pig, uh, the, the wolf that broke into the one house, has to break into the other houses using some means for every single house. Right? He doesn't just get to take over the entire environment. The problem with physical machines, separate physical machines, though, is you have multiple operating systems. You get no resource sharing. They're very expensive. Um, and so we came up with virtualiz virtualization of the operating system. So the second houses we're going to look at is what we defined as the duplex. 
So the pigs are living in a duplex. There is limited amount of sharing in a duplex en environment, but we have really good security, uh, pretty good security. So in a duplex environment, you know, the, 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 the only thing you have adjoining the two is the wall, and usually you're going to use really good security on that wall. So the, the fact you have to think about in a virtualized environment is the attack surface on the host kernel. Okay, so when we, from now on, we're going to look at the weakest point of vulnerability is the host kernel. So if I'm in a virtualized environment, I have to first break, into, break apart my kernel on my virtual machine, at which point I then have to break through KVM. KVM is a very small hole in the, you know, to the, to the host kernel that I have to figure out a way to break through. Then I'm going to hit SVIRT, and I know that you guys all use KVM for your virtualization, and you have SE Linux on there, which is, provides SVIRT. With SVIRT, we can write SE Linux policy for very tight controls. We know exactly what a virtual machine can do, and we can prevent it from doing anything else. So we have very tight controls. So after I finally break through SVIRT, now I have to attack the host kernel. So it's, I have to go through all those steps to get to the point where I can even talk to the host kernel. So in a virtualized environment, I have pretty good security. Not as good as separate houses or separate physical machines, but I have pretty good security. When we get to containers, now we have the pigs living in an apartment building. And not only that, but the apartment building happens to have a front desk with all the keys to all the apartments. So that's where the single point of failure is. And that pig sitting at the front desk there represents the Linux kernel. So every single process that's running inside of a container is talking to the host kernel. If you are running, everybody in here says, oh, can I run RHEL 4 um, uh, operating systems on top of RHEL 7? Sure you can, but it's very old code, and all of a sudden you have this very old code, code talking to the kernel. Can that code be subverted? Maybe. If there's a bug in your Linux kernel, and that pig, can, uh, that wolf, could somehow activate it, he takes over all the apartments. So all of a sudden, every single container, all the data that's associated with those containers is vulnerable because I have a single kernel that I can attack. That sounds harsh, right? Why would anybody use containers? Well, let's look at the next step. So now we have pigs leave it living in a hostel. How many people in this room run, run multiple services on the same piece of hardware at the same time? Right? Most of you. Most of them, traditionally, we run multiple services. That's pigs in a hostel. Okay? And all of you guys, the, the main security in the pigs in the hostel is having SE Linux on in enforcing mode. Now, how many people in the room run their machines with SE Linux in enforcing mode? I don't want to ask because it'll depress me. <laughs> okay? So let's look at what SE Linux in, in you know, set, set and force zero is pigs in a park. <laughs> okay? So how many people run pigs in a park here? <laughs> OK. OK, so we've, we've settled on that. So each step down the way, we get better resource sharing. So we have different, different uh, security goals. So for this talk, we're going to say that the best solution, the best uh, cross between resource controls, cheapness of running your services, having decent security, especially when we go through the third chapter, you have decent security. We're going to say containers. We're going to pick the apartment building for the pigs. So you got good resources sharing, and Philly, uh, oh, Major here? I gave him a shout out yesterday. There's Major, okay, this is Major's, uh, Major Hayden's uh, website. Uh, so every time you guys put your pigs in the park, I wipe, weep a little bit. So we chose pigs in an apartment building. So it's best combination of resource sharing and ease of maintenance. So now that we've pick, picked the apartment building for the pigs, you guys got to think about what quality, what is the quality, what kind of apartment building do you want to put your pigs in? And guess where we're going towards the story, right? So what platform do you run your containers? Who here wants to put the pigs in a house of straw? OK, so a house of straw is a self-built container host platform. You guys go out and create your own. All right, you don't care. Usually, you're probably the last thing you worry about is security, especially all the people that have their pigs in the, in the park. You're not going to think about security. You're not going to have any support for doing this. You're going to build your own container environment, and what happens, happens. Are you going to update it with new security vulnerabilities? Are you going to have a, a security team watching for it? Probably not. So that's one way you can put your pigs in, a, in the environment. The second one is using community platform. Community platform is very good. 
you put your pigs, you know, the, the, we, get, we get up to the stick level, um, but again, you don't have any type of, you know, any type of update system come on, uh, coming in. A lot of people talk to me about uh, CoreOS. Everybody hear about CoreOS here? Okay. I'm gonna say, CoreOS is a really good idea, and we've, we, we're looking at it as an idea for running containers, but to me, the interesting thing about running a container environment or an operating system, what's the most important thing about RHEL? The most important thing about RHEL is the Linux kernel. At least I believe that because we have more kernel engineers than we have any other kind of engineers. So the kernel, engi kernel engineering team at Red Hat is probably well over 200. All right, we, have a, we probably have more kernel engineers than just about any company, you know, especially per capita than any other company in the world. So we invest heavily in the kernel. We have the uh, kernel engineers for performance, we have kernel engineers for security, we have kernel engineers for all the different subsystems. So the most important thing on the, you know, that Red Hat invests in is the Linux kernel. When I'm running a container environment, what is the one thing that everybody talks to? The only thing that's shared between all the processes inside your container is the Linux kernel. So you're going to buy a kernel from a, system, from a system which has no kernel engineers, from a company that has no kernel engineers? Are you going to pay for that? Is that what you invest in? So I think you've got to think about that. What, how is that kernel being updated? Who's watching out for security updates? Who's providing the security updates for it? And that's what you're buying with a house of sticks. So of course, RHEL, this is my marketing spiel, RHEL is the house of brick. So with RHEL, you get security uh, updates, you get uh, this, this excellent kernel team, you got people working on your performance, um, helping you uh, get the system performing as well as possible, you get RHEL maintenance, okay? So that's the idea. If you're gonna run a container environment, think of the host that you put in the containers on. Think about what you're investing in. Why do you invest in RHEL? What is the importance of RHEL? Is the most important thing the kernel? In a container environment, the most important thing is the kernel. Now we get to the fun part. This is what I spend all my time working on. So I am the lead developer of the Docker. I have a bunch of guys. If you were watching the video before, I showed you a ton of people on my team. I'm the project lead for the Docker team, but I come from a huge security background. I've been working on SE Linux forever. So let's look at how we actually separate the kernels. So we, we talked a lot about, um, earlier in the, in the talk, we talked about the attack surface on the kernel. So everything we do in a security environment is we want to limit the attack surface on the kernel. We want to take features away. We want to look at the way that the processes communicate with the kernel, and when we can, we want to take away their ability to manipulate the kernel. This quote, if you Google, you will find my picture next to it, okay? So I started uh, about a year and a half ago working on Docker, and I started looking at the security of it. And the first th quote that I came, the first time I gave this presentation, I came up with the quote, containers don't contain. As we've described earlier, the reason I tell you that is you are running privileged processes inside of the container, and that if there is a vulnerability in the kernel, they're gonna take over this, the operating system. So exactly what we talked about earlier, that you were living in apartment buildings, those con containers don't contain. But really what I'm saying is they don't contain as well as virtualization. They don't contain as well as separate systems. But they contain better than multiple serve. You run every process in your machine in a separate container, that's a lot better than running all your processes without a container. So from that point of view, they do contain. But what I really want you to think about when you're doing this is do you care? You guys are running your, a lot of processes in the hostel, so all of a sudden we're gonna container technology come in and we, we, you know, we're gonna allow you to tighten the security on the processes. But my fear is, is people get lax. You start to look at the processes, run, my process in a container, I don't have to follow the good security practices that I've followed for the last 15 years of using, using Linux in the enterprise. So you gotta think about that. Should you care? Again, if you're running your processes inside of a container, the same way you've always, if you're running a privileged process inside of a container, if you're running your Apache service inside of a container, it's gonna be more secure than running your Apache service outside of the container if and only if you continue to drop privileges as quickly as possible. That, that Apache process should still run as UID 60 when it's inside of the container. Same exact 
uh, stuff you took care of prior to containers you should continue to, to do. Treat container services like regular services. Drop privileges as quickly as possible. Run your system as uh, non-root whenever possible. Treat containers and root. Treat root inside of the container as root outside of it. When I talk to the people in the government that want to do certification on containers, I say we have to say root in the container is root outside of the container, exact same thing. We're trying to do a better job, but I don't want to have anybody come to me and say, you said containers are you know, more secure. I'm not saying it. A fellow engineer at Red Hat <laughs> quoted this about a year ago. Except he didn't wor use the word crap, but I, you know, this is videotaped. Only run containers from trusted parties. Okay? And we're going to cover that. This is going to get heavily covered in, this, in chapter four. So I'll let it go to then. So why don't containers contain? Well, I, I've sort of beat that to death a little bit because I explained in the kernel. Um, but uh, some people talk about trusted Solaris. I mean, not trusted Solaris, uh, just the Solaris zones. S Solaris zones had a lot more coverage of the kernel. So when we, if you've had containers explained to you, they usually talk about namespaces. So namespaces are a mechanism for changing the worldview of processes on the system. The problem is that everything in the Linux kernel is not namespaced. If it was namespaced, it would be called KVM. Okay, you get into the virtualized world when you get into full virtualized operating system. That's what KVM is. So we have limited namespaces that we take advantage of. Containers are not comprehensive like KVM. So there's one of the mechanisms for communicating with the kernel is through the kernel file systems. So slash sys, slash proxys, slash uh, sysfs um, are all not namespaced. C groups, SE Linux, device, loading device um, modules, things like that, they're not namespace. There's no way for the kernel to say, this group of processes gets this access in the kernel and this process. So if I can communicate with any one of these, I have the potential for taking over the system. So let's look at the overview of security inside of Docker containers. So the first thing we do is, since we have these kernel file systems, we can't run processes unless they have access to this. They have to be able to read these file systems or else everything will blow up. You think SE Linux blows up things, you run containers without these file systems, nothing's going to work. But what we can do is most processes will work with these containers mounted as read-only. So if I can mount them as read-only, allow the processes to read from these file systems, but not write to them, I can get better security. So in Docker, out of the box, without, as long as you don't run dash dash privileged, all the kernel file systems are mounted read-only. So if you try to write to them, you'll get a uh, read-only error, even though you're root. Another thing we, that's been done over in Linux over the last 20 years is the idea of capabilities. So 20 years ago or 15 years ago, somewhere uh, a long time ago, someone decided that root should not fully be root. Okay, what they wanted to do is root meant all privileges, and they wanted to take the Linux kernel and they wanted to break it apart into smaller subsections of capabilities. So I'll give you an example, ping command. Anybody ever look at ping command and set UID root? The reason it's set UID root is it needs to be able to create raw IP sockets. So it needs to create raw IP sockets. It never needs to set UID, never needs to you know, do load kernel modules, nothing like that. So what, they, what the kernel engineers did is they said, we'll get, create this capabilities and we'll create one called net raw socket and we can basically say ping can have net raw socket and nothing else. So what the kernel engineers did is they said, well, the most we'll ever need is 32. So they said, we'll get, create 32. We have an integer, okay? So they started going through every, you know, all of a sudden they looked at, um, here's another interesting story for the old timers in here. They know that, do you know that if you bind to a port less than 1024, your system's secure? <laughs> did you know that? Yeah, because back when the ARPANET was first being designed, um, there was only like 12 computers in the world that were on the ARPANET, so anybody that had root privileges on that could have bind to 1024, and they allowed the students that had gone to their computer systems to bind gre greater than 1024. So if you communicated with a computer that was had a port less than 1024, that meant an admin did it, and he couldn't be trusted. Okay? 
So, so there's actually a net bind service. So any, any process that needs to bind to ports less than 1024 needs root privileges. And it's called net bind service. So that's why Apache needs to start as root to bind to port 80. Okay? Makes no sense nowadays, but you can't really change the Linux kernel. Matter of fact, if you change the Linux kernel, then containers would never work. So the con one of the reasons containers even work is because Linus Tavalis, when he first started the Linux kernel, said he would never break backward compatibility. So that means that you can run an, a program that was written for the very first version of Linux and it would work inside of a container. So he never breaks backward compatibility. So anyways, capabilities came along and the idea was to take those 32, there's only 32 different things that you'd ever want different privileges in the Linux kernel and they figured that out right away. And uh, so they started coming up with these capabilities. Um, one of the, uh, so this is a list of the capabilities that we actually remove when you run Docker, because most processes never need these capabilities. Problem happened later on when they were dealing with capabilities was because they only picked out 32, when they got up to around 27, 28, they said, holy smokes, we're running out of these capabilities. So instead of creating new capabilities, they also they said, well, let's just, we have a new part of the kernel, we'll just find a capability that's sort of like it and we'll add it to it. Another thing that happened is engineers and kernel engineers probably also are lazy. So it was a pain in the neck to go out and actually allocate a new capability. So if you had a capability that sort of seemed like it was an administrative capability, or sort of seemed like it was a network administrating capability, you had net admin and you had sysadmin, so they started pouring all the capabilities onto there. So there's cap net admin and cap uh, sysadmin, and cap sysadmin became the catch-all. So here, quick, quickly look at all the uh, capabilities that are assigned to cap sysadmin. So there's two pages of them in the, and that, that's only the ones that are listed in the H file. So there's two pages of capabilities assigned to CAP sysadmin. But the nice thing is we remove CAP sysadmin from the system. The most important thing in CAP sysadmin here is it actually removes the ability to mount. So since we mounted the file systems read-only, we don't want to allow the root process inside of the container to remount it read-write. So we remove, so you are not allowed in a container in a non-privileged mode to mount anything. You're also not allowed to set the host name, set the domain name, uh, do uh, certain types of churn on IPCs, this churn on swap, turn off swap. Um, there's all sorts of stuff. And you can go, I'll go look at capabilities.h file. But we still allow certain capabilities in the system, but because we can get rid of cap net admin and we can get rid of cap sysadmin, we actually tighten the security quite a bit of containers. But there's still about 15, and I don't have the list, I probably should print out the list in this talk of the capabilities that we still have to allow for most applications. You have the ability, even though I know you'll never do it, to actually remove additional capabilities. So if you have a program that's never gonna call set UID, you could remove set UID. Um, so there is, a, if you look at Docker, there's a cap, cap remove and cap add. Namespaces, I usually say, are not a security thing. All right, so namespaces are changing the worldview of the system, but in Linux container world, we do take advantage of two namespaces that sort of give you security. So the PID namespace eliminates your ability to see all the other processes on the system. So if you can't see the other, a lot of times the process inside of your container won't even know it's running in a, in a container. It'll just say, oh, there's only two processes on this entire system. And I guess I could probably figure out that there's no kernel, so maybe I am a running container. But you can't figure out where the other processes are in the system. So those are hidden. And the network namespace basically eliminates your ability to see the network or the physical networks uh, on the system. So you might only see a, uh, a you know, virtual network in the environment not able to see it. There's another thing uh, we take advantage in Docker called the um, device C group. I think it should have been a device namespace, um, and there's a long reason for it. But basically what the device C group is, we talked earlier about one way to attack the kernel is through kernel file systems. The next way to attack the kernel, or to, go out, uh, to communicate with the kernel, right to the kernel, is through the device nodes. So what, I don't want to have a physical, device, you know, physical disk device inside of my container. If I can create a physical disk, I might be able to write to the physical disk and break out. So what we do is use the C group's namespace to actually, we provide the only devices on the system and then we prevent the root process inside of the container from creating additional device nodes. 
So device nodes allow the process to configure the kernel. Those are the device, devices that you will see in your everyday Docker container. So those are the only devices that are, we allow to, for the processes to communicate with the kernel. We also mount the images. So the file systems that are mounted into the container, right, that we only allow those device nodes, but if I brought, brought down my image, I might be able to put on my image a device node that I could break through the kernel. So we would mount all the devices as no dev, which means the kernel basically sees no dev and it says no device nodes can exist on that file system. So that's also a security measure. All right, SC Linux. I know you're all here for that, and most of you have coloring books. <laughs> SC Linux is a labeling system. You guys read it, come on. Okay, you can sit down now. Okay. I do feel like I'm a cult leader. <laughs> okay, everybody's got the SC Linux coloring book. If you don't have one, you should have showed up earlier. We, uh, I think we ran out of SC Linux coloring books. So when we look at SC Linux, SC Linux is going to provide this. Everything has a label on it, but we're going to look a little bit at the label. SC Linux usually talks about a thing called type enforcement. So here we have our dog and cat example. So in a uh, SE Linux system, every single process gets a type associated with it. So in this case, we're gonna say there's a type of a dog and there's a type of a cat. And the current, and a, uh, if you used SE Linux in your, um, in your uh, system, and you had your Apache server, the Apache would be labeled httpd underscore t, and your MariaDB would be mysql underscore t. So each process gets a label in the system. Each object on the system gets a label on the system. So we label cat chow and we label dog chow. We also have a classification. So we have files, directories. In this case, we're going to use food. So we have a classification. We're going to say it's, it's dog chow food and it's cat chow food. And then we're going to write a rule into the kernel that looks just like this. That says allow a cat to eat cat chow and allow a dog to eat dog chow. In SE Linux, anything that is not allowed, if you don't have a rule like this, you are denied. Okay, so if you actually look at SE Linux, you will see thousands and thousands of allow rules. So everything by default is denied. So the cats are able to eat the cat, the dogs are able to eat the dog food, the cat can ask for more, and the dog tries to eat the cat food, and the colonel steps in and says, no, not allowed. <laughs> Does everybody still think SC Linux is complicated? Yes. Okay. How can I make it any simpler for you people? Okay. So that's called type enforcement. So that protects the host from the containers. So with the ty type enforcement system, we're going to say we're going to label all the containers with a single label. So all containers are actually run. I hate the label, but we, we it's a, there's history to it, and, and maybe I'll change it to them. But, but it's actually... Um, Let's see. So all the processes are labeled as SVIRT, Secure Virtualization, LXC, because we're using Linux containers, and then and underscore net means that we're giving it network access. So we label all processes inside of the containers as SVIRT, LXC, net T, and then we label all the files inside of the, inside of the um, container as being SVIRT, Sandbox, File, T. We also allow processes in the container to read and execute anything that's under slash user. And container processes can only write to SVIRT file sandbox T. Okay? That's the only type that they're allowed to write to. So if a container process breaks out and it tries to write to slash var, it's going to be blocked. If it writes to slash device nodes, it's going to be blocked. So everything has to match that labeling. One problem with type enforcement is type enforcement means that all my containers can, can attack all my other containers on the system because they're all the same type. All, it's in, all the content is the same type. So we take advantage of a separate part of SE Linux, which is called MCS separation. 
It was based on MLS um, separation, multi-category security, based on MLS. I don't want to go into what MLS is because I'm going to run out of time. But basically what we do is the Docker daemon picks out a random label every time it starts up a container. It picks out a random section of the label called the MCS label. I'm going to show you what they look like in a second. And then it labels all the content based on it, and it labels all the process, then launches the processes on it. It's the same way OpenShift works. It's the same way SVIRT worked. I invented the thing about eight years ago, and I use it for everything. Okay, because basically it says I want to lock down this object to match, it has to match exactly the other object. So the processes in the file have to match. So now we have two dogs. One's named Fido, one named Spot. We have dog chow, we've added an additional label to the dog chow to match Fido and Spot. Fido's able to eat his, and the kernel stops Spot from eating Fido's dog food. Okay, again, simple. It's in the coloring book, it covers it. That's how SE Linux works. So basically, if you have content in a container that is, you know, you have to make sure it's labeled correctly. Now, we've added things to Docker to actually cause the labeling to happen directly. It finally got merged. It's in Docker 1.6.2 or Docker 1.7. It's in the Docker upstream. You can put a dash uh, when you volume mount into the container. So the one place where SE Linux will break your containers is when you volume mount in. So if you take a directory, say Wildlife MariaDB, and you mount it into a container, it's going to come in as being labeled as MariaDB data. And SE Linux is going to block it. So if you use, when you do a volume mount, you use colon uh, uppercase Z, which is, as Z is always a letter, it will relabel the content to match what the process content is. So that's SE Linux, MCS. So that's what an MCS label looks like. So it's some combination of S0, colon C1, comma C2. It's traditionally used for MLS environments, top secret, secret, but uh, too much time to cover that. Um, launches, so the Docker daemon takes care of launching it, launches, uh, labels all the content, and then launches, launches the processes to match the label. So Docker without SE Linux. This is a dating myself thing, okay? I don't think they do this anymore, okay? In the future, hopefully in the near future, we're going to have a thing called SecComp. So right now, everything I've shown you, that's the end of the security for containers at this point. Red Hat's been working very hard to get SecComp into the container. What SecComp is, another way you attack the kernel is you attack the kernel through syscalls. So on a x86-64 machine, there are 650 syscalls available to processes. If any one of those syscalls can cause a subversion of the kernel, then I can take the kernel over. If I could eliminate those syscalls or eliminate a large group of those syscalls, I can make it tighter. So what SecComp allows me to do is start to take, so a process can say, I want to put a SecComp filter in, and I'm only going to call, the, my children processes are only going to call these syscalls, and, and some of the other syscalls will be eliminated. So it shrinks the attack surface on the kernel. Uh, these are some of the syscalls that we're going to eliminate. Uh, sys, by the way, SecComp is used in QMU. It's used, it was actually developed at Google for um, the Chromium browser, so that they added patches to the Linux kernel to be able to do this. Uh, so we can eliminate those syscalls. But far more importantly, when I turn on syscall filtering, I can eliminate the ability to run other versions. Uh, well, basically, uh, a 32-bit system has 325 syscalls. The reason there are 650 syscalls in x86 and only 350 or 325 in a 32-bit machine is because 64-bit machine can call 32 can run 32-bit applications. If you're not going to run 32-bit applications inside of your container, I can wipe out 325 syscalls. That means if I'm running an x86-64 container and there's a vulnerability in one of the 32-bit syscalls, I'm not susceptible to it. So I can really shrink the attack surface on the kernel by a great deal. We can also block old weird networks. <laughs> How many people in here are using net, netware? <laughs> Apple Talk? <laughs> DeckNet? Nobody? <laughs> oh, the kernel can do it. Oh, there's a DeckNet back there. All right. <laughs> An old VMS guy. <laughs> so in the future, 
How many people here use a namespace and say, get all giddy? Ooh, use a namespace. It's coming. It's always coming. All right. Use a namespace. It's like the nirvana. Everybody hears about using namespace and say, yeah, that's the Linux stuff. That's tough to understand, but that user namespace, I can get, grab onto that. <laughs> Let me explain what user namespace is. So you want to map non-root users to a user inside, in, uh, to root inside of the container. So the goal is to basically say, I pick a UID on the system, UID 5000. And what I can do with the kernel is I can create a container and I can say root UID 0 inside of the container is actually UID 5000 outside of the container. So therefore, if a process breaks out of a container, it's going to be treated as UID 5000. Sounds good, huh? Awesome. It is good. There's some problems with it, though. Okay. We can protect the host using this functionality. So if I had UID 5000 inside of my container um, as root and it gets out, all of a sudden it's just a, a non-privileged process for the rest of the system. The problem with it is if I don't map another UID to the container, every other UID is treated as, as minus one and it's not accessible. So if I want to run that Apache, remember I said I, I always want to run Apache as UID 60? So if I want to run 60, I actually have to do 5,000 to 5,060 mapped into my container as 0 to 60. So now I've used up a range of 60. But I might want to just be safe and do 1,000. So I'm going to do, map 1,000 containers. So now I want to run 100 containers. Well, I want separation on the containers. So I'm going to take 5,000 to 6,000 and map that to one container. And then I'm going to take 6,000 to 7,000 and map it to another container. And I'm going to do so. You guys want to do that? That's what they're going to do. That's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to do all these weird mappings. Another big problem with using namespace is the file system has no concept of it. There's no Linux file system right now that follows user namespace. So if I have a root file inside of a user namespace that I have UID 5000, guess what it is? It's minus one. It's not accessible. So if I volume mount something into the container, I have to chone that directory to match the container. If I want two directories shared between two containers, I have to run the root as the same on both of the containers because they'll be different, right? There's different mappings. One of the big, big things that Docker is based on is copy on write file system. So if I have an image that I want to share between 100 different containers, and I'm using UID need namespace, and I want UID different for every single container, I have to make 100 different copies of that file system. I have to run a chone, zero, you know, change 0 to 5,000, chone 5,000, colon 5,000, star, recursive. So this is why the user namespace has not shown up yet anywhere. As a matter of fact, anybody from Pivotal here? Stop picking on us. Right? Uh, Pivotal all the time is saying Red Hat is behind the times because they don't have user namespace turned on in the RHEL 7 kernel. Well, in RHEL 7.2, we're going to turn it on. I still don't think we're going to use it. Okay? So far, user namespace has only basically opened up vulnerabilities to the system. Matter of fact, Docker just had a big one that all the security was turned off by turning on user namespace. The only system that wasn't susceptible to it was RHEL because we didn't have user namespace turned on. Okay? So there is... Using namespace could be good, but we really need to learn how to use it. Chapter four. Where do the pigs get their furniture? How do I secure the content inside of my container? Okay. How many people have been working in Linux since 1999, pre-rel? Okay, I was going to, if I had a little more time, this should be playing horror music right now. <laughs> okay, the goal was to play really spooky music here and have something. So where did you go to get your software in Linux 1999 world? Okay, you went to yahoo.com or altavista.com and then you Googled the uh, content. Okay, <laughs> that's what you did. And then you said, I found it in RPM.net, <laughs> OK? Then you downloaded and installed it onto your system. And then you had, you had your security guy or someone in your company and say, hey, I just was reading in TradeMag that Zlib had a vulnerability. And he asked you, Do you, are you vulnerable to that? And you would say, and he would say, how many copies of Zlib vulnerability do we have? And you would say, I haven't got a clue, OK? 
So Red Hat came to the rescue. So what, why you guys have been buying RHEL and paying my salary all these years is because we came up with certified applications. We gave you applications from a trusted source. You trust us to make sure that the applications are at least as secure as we can make them. And when they break, when shell shock happens, when something goes wrong, we come out with a fix to fix it on your system. So now we're in Linux 2015, and you guys are going out and grabbing random content, content, content off the internet, installing it as root in your system, and guess what happens? We came up with certified applications, and you guys are back to doing this again, getting random content off the streets. <laughs> so people have no idea of the quality of the software that's in their Docker images. And this is not a slam on Docker. I'm not attacking Docker. Okay, I, this has nothing to do with Docker, it's just the mindset that's going on right now. Another way you can build content, put content, is you can build your own content into the container. So you build it, in, you know, basically people go out and they, they build the content, you know, either, either locally or they get it from some uh, third party distribution. Everybody's putting BusyBox, that's a big one. I can get a small little container if I put BusyBox inside of it, okay? So a lot of people are doing that. So let's talk about DevOps. Okay, how many people in here are developers? How many people are operators? Do you guys get along? Remember Oklahoma, there was the ranches and that. All right, so, so we have DevOps. Everybody's crazy about DevOps. Now, I'm a developer, I'm not an operator, okay? But, so I understand developers. So containers move the responsibility for security from the operator to the developer. Right, so when I have my container application in there, it's up to the developer to fix the code. If a secure, if the, the shell shock happens, it's the developer who has to update his image. We're taking the responsibility away from all you operators because you guys have nothing better to do than just sit around and just wait for that developer to come and fix your problem. So operators in the room. Do you trust your developers to fix security issues in their images? <laughs> Nobody? <laughs> developers, are you going to fix the security issues? Are you going to jump right on it? What happens when the developer disappears? He takes a job somewhere else. How many people here are running RHEL 4 systems because they ain't got the developers anymore? Okay, this is the model we're moving towards with containers. Something to think about. That was supposed to play, hold on. But the importance of this treaty transcends numbers. We have listened to the wisdom of, in an old Russian maxim, and I'm sure you're familiar with it. Mr. General Secretary, though my pronunciation may give you difficulty, the maxim is dovayai no provayai, trust but verify. <laughs> you repeat that at every meeting. <laughs> All right, is Dan Corsi here? Okay, so when I was developing this presentation, I put that up, and he had no idea who those two guys are. He's 32 years old. <laughs> okay? I mean, he had some idea, but he had no idea where this, this quote was going. So it made me feel friggin' old as hell, okay? <laughs> I was in college. Actually, this was probably after college when this happened. Okay, so for those youngins in the crowd, the old guy on the right actually... Uh, well, that's his wife right there. She, she's still alive. And that's uh, President Bush, and that's Barbara Bush. So the, guy, the old guy on, the, uh, on my left, your right, was President Reagan. The other guy was named Gorbachev. He was the head of the Russia, or the Soviet Union at the time. And we had signed an agreement to get rid of nuclear weapons. Okay? And the whole idea was the Russians would get rid of so many, we would get so many, and that's what it is. So that's just a little history lesson. So what happens when the next shell shock hits? Anybody familiar with what happened to Docker 
again, I'm not ripping Docker. This is not a rip on Docker. This is not Docker's responsibility. Docker I.O. has somewhere, I've heard, like 40,000 images out there. A security team went out and ran a simple scan on those 30,000 images and found 30% of them had security vulnerabilities in it. Probably a lot of bash exploits. A lot of, okay. Why? Developers never updated their software. They didn't care about it. They put the thing up there. It's up there forever. No one's ever going to go back and look at it. All right. So 10 years from now, all of a sudden, you have 150,000 images in your environment. Who's going to come and fix those images? All right. Think about it. So this is not Docker's responsibility. This is the developer. So all the operators in there, turn to your left, turn to your right, and say, developers, you can't let this happen inside of my company. So what are we doing about it? Well, we're doing the same thing we did in Linux 1999. We came out with Enterprise Linux. We came out with certified applications. So Red Hat is trying very hard to convince people to use good security practices, provide security uh, uh, certified applications to do it, and we will make sure that those applications are updated. We're building tooling. We're building tooling to be able to examine the images on your machine, tell you if you're vulnerable to them. But guess what? We're not going to be examining your busy box to figure out if it's vulnerable. We're not going to be examining your Ubuntu or your uh, Gentoo or your, your Fedora or your CentOS images. All we can examine is rel images. So if you want your Im images examined, you come, they have to be rel images. If you're getting canonical images, you've got to go to canonical and say, we'll trust you guys to examine the images. If you're going to get them for BusyBox, you got to, I don't know who BusyBox is. I guess this one guy who did his BusyBox. Gen 2, you're on your own. You built it yourself. <laughs> Fedora, it's good. You have somebody that might look at it for 12 months. After 12 months, 30, uh, 15 months, then you're on your own. That, uh, you're better, better updated. So think about this stuff when you're putting this stuff on your machine. All, right? this is, all I'm trying to get at is common sense here. <laughs> okay, so everybody, uh, yesterday we had a signing, myself and uh, Maureen, who do, does the wonderful artwork in the, in the coloring book. I wanted this picture in the coloring book, but she has like a, she's uh, uh, going to have another baby, but she has like a three-year-old, the three-year-old loves it, and she thought this cartoon was too violent, so. <laughs> so she gave it to me and said, don't use it, and I goes, I used it. <laughs> so. Don't let this be you. So at this point, well, I guess it's questions. Nothing? Yes? Yeah, we, we actually, the, the limit is uh, a half a million. OK, uh, and that made sense when we did it for Respirate, because I don't, can't imagine 100, half a million virtual machines. I think, you know, we can, right now we're just using two categories. If we added another category, it becomes a, a it'll, it'll skyrocket. So I think we might have to add, end up adding, because containers could definitely get up to a half a million images on your system, you know, potentially. I mean, in, not in any short time, but over time, I think that could happen. Yes? How the, enabling it just for the docking? Well, I mean, SC Linux has to, you mean running, yeah. Yeah, running your yeah. Yeah. Right, so, so if you ran SC Linux in enforcing mode just for your project atom, rel atomic systems, yeah. or just for the Fedora uh, rel systems, I would say right now that everybody in this room that runs KVM should run SC Linux in enforcing mode. Matter of fact, if you came to the previous talk, there was a, uh, they, they were talking about the different vulnerabilities that have been exposed over the years, and the big ones around QMU breakouts. So SC Linux and enforcing mode would lock that down. If you run libvirt, you're just a, a system that just does run virtual machines, SC Linux will never bother an administrator in history. If you run containers, you should run with SC Linux. SC Linux on a system with multiple services communicating in all different ways is tough to do. I realize that. I've been beaten to death over it for years. But running containers with SC Linux enforcing mode, running uh, virtual machines with SC Linux enforcing mode on, on rel systems, I think is a no-brainer. I think anybody that doesn't do it is just because they got in the habit of always running the systems with SC Linux off, and they haven't looked at anything since RHEL 4. Yes? If I'm launching containers by some other means than Docker, if I'm launching right out of systemd, um, how much So you're running systemd and spawn? 
System at the end spawn has the ability to launch containers with a label. I've added that functionality. But there's no, I mean, you don't have a daemon that's automatically picking the different labels up. So it would be up to you to pick different labels and make sure your content is labeled correctly. But no, we're planning on looking at potentially adding same functionality to Rocket if Rocket starts to take off. So, or our system, the ends bonded. Anybody else? Yes. Is there any way to whitelist? You mean so the process would not be enforced? Uh, but, I mean, I, it's very difficult for me to say you, just one process in the container. I mean, it, it, theoretically, we could have SE Linux do transitions, so we could have a, a certain label that transitions to so only one executable would have it. But the problem is if you mix up, one of the interesting things as we get into containers and like debugging containers, so you take a privileged process outside of a container, you go into a container, and you don't trust the content in the container, the container could attack that process. So it's, a real, it's real difficult to have sort of a mixed environment. But right now, no, that we basically run everything with the same label, all, all the processes with the same label inside of the container. Anybody else? Yes? SE Linux inside of the container? SE Linux is, is enforcing inside of the container, because basically, what, what's a interesting, if you go into a Docker container and you did get enforced, it'll tell you that SE Linux is disabled. If you're outside of the container, SE Linux is enabled. Well, SE Linux is lying inside of the container. The reason we lie inside of the container is that lots of processes inside of the container try to do SE Linux stuff if SE Linux is enabled. So for instance, if you do a yum install inside of a container, RPM is going to try to label stuff, and SE Linux is going to block the labeling, so it causes some confusion, or user, user rat, things like that blow up. So right now, we basically run the processes with the label, and we lie to the processes inside of the container that SE Linux is enabled, so they don't do SE Linux. It's not a security measure. It's just to stop them from doing stupid things. Um, there has been talk potentially, you can run SE Linux with different labels. So right now we run with full network for a process. So I can run processes with no network access or limited network access. Um, and you can, um, we've, we, I, I think eventually researchers are going to look into having transitions. So you could have processes with two different labels inside of a container. But from the container's point of view, we want to basically have the, the, the processes not doing any SE Linux stuff. And, and SE, they'd be blocked from it anyways, right? Anybody else? Yep. Right, so, right, so in, in one of the features that we've added to Docker is right now if you run a Docker dash dash permissive, uh, uh, privileged, um, it will turn off SE Linux, but really what it does is it basically causes the Docker daemon to label the, the process as SPC, so super privileged container T, which is like un unconfined T. It basically means that the process can do anything it wants. There's other options that you can actually modify the SE Linux labels inside of the container from Docker run command. So one of the things you can do is Docker run dash dash security opt equals type uh, um, label colon disabled. So you could basically do the same. You can, you can run either permitted mode, uh, which, which eliminates all security, or you can eliminate just SE Linux, or you can modify SE Linux. So we have full capabilities to change the labels. Again, I don't think anybody's going to do this, but or very few people are going to do that. But yeah, you can, you can change the way SE Linux enforces the labels, or the way the Docker daemon assigns the labels. Anybody else? Yes. I, I think there are, there are articles. I think I, I probably wrote something about that. By the way, everything I've covered here, there's four, I probably should have put them at the end of this, four articles I wrote covering everything that was covered in here without the cartoons. Um, they were all on opensource.com. So if you go to opensource.com, uh, uh, this is a little trick in Google, you can actually do search for Dan Walsh, site colon, opensource.com, and you will find all the articles that I've written for opensource.com on security of containers. So there's four different articles that I, I've written on, on these topics that go somewhat deeper than what I did, what I did now without the humor, okay? So, anybody else? Are we done? I think I was supposed to end, right? 4.30? That's it. Oh.
So every year, every year Red Hat has a competition to get a top 10 presenter, okay? I'm always in the competition, so I need good reviews. If you didn't like the talk today, then you're probably a guy that has pigs in the park. So make sure I get a good review, all right? 